to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ when Paul brings the message of Romans to a close, he brings it to a head by saying, Love does no harm to a neighbor, but love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans chapter 13, verse number 10. We welcome you to our final study in the book of Romans. This is our fourth installment in our study of the book of Romans, and we're so glad that you've joined us for this study today. As with the last lessons that we studied, we want to encourage you to make sure you have your Bible handy as we're going to look today to the Word of God to see what God has to say about living according to the gospel of Christ each and every day. Friend, we want you to know that members of the Lord's Church, the churches of Christ in your area, are helping to bring these lessons to you. Uh, we hope that you'll stop by and let these members of the Lord's Church know how much you've enjoyed these lessons and, and study the Word of God with them. They'd love for you to visit their assembly on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday. If you've got a, a, a Bible question or something that you're concerned about spiritually, or if you'd just like to sit down and have a good Bible study, they'd be more than happy to open the Word of God with you at the Lord's Church in your area. And friend, we want you to know that with this evangelistic work, the gospel of Christ, our main concern is that we want men and women to go to heaven. We're concerned about, about souls and about men and women knowing God. And friend, we want to help you in your study of the Word of God. We have video and audio lessons on every book in both the Old and New Testament. We have studies on a wide variety of topical subjects that deal with the church and salvation and, and worship and things like under that. You'll be hard pressed to find a study that we don't have on a biblical subject and we make all of those available to you free of charge. Just visit our website thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access our videos and audios. You can download those on your computer, or if you'd like to have a hard copy, those are available from our media request form that you can fill out from our website. And friend, we want you to know that today, as we think about this practical lesson about living according to the gospel, that our aim and focus is upon what does the Word of God say in this matter. We begin today in Romans chapter 13, looking at the last four chapters in the book of Romans. Paul has now taught these Christians that it's the gospel that saves. It's faith in Jesus that saves. Men and women need to stop rejecting the law of God and live according to faith. And what does it mean to really live according to faith by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, friend, it means that as best we can, we follow the laws of the land that we live in. Chapter 13 is a great treatise on uh, obeying the government, obeying the laws of the land of which we live. Look at Romans 13 verses 1 through 7 where Christians are clearly taught that governmental power is given by God. The Bible says in Romans 13 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, of course, is due. 
As we mentioned, the Christian, this section deals a lot about with Christian living, how the Christian ought to live in his everyday life. And friend, one of those is the Christian wants to be a good example. And in being a good example, as long as the laws of the land do not violate the laws of God, we want to live in accord with those laws. Now, we understand, according to Acts chapter 5, when the two butt heads, when God's law and man's law are different, when God says one thing and man's law says one thing, well, Acts chapter 5 teaches us we ought to obey God rather than man. But if the laws of the land do not contradict or violate the laws of God, I am bound by God to obey those laws. Now, what do we mean? It could be a, a variety of different things. It could be something as simple as wearing your seatbelt or obeying the speed limit laws that are set before us. It could be obeying city ordinances and, and laws of the country that are put in place to, to help people. And of course, as the writer specifically mentions, the dreaded day that we all hate, April 15th, right? Tax day. Well, Christians ought to pay their taxes. Didn't Jesus teach us that? When they brought, talked to Jesus about taxes, and they brought Jesus a piece of money, and they asked Jesus about that, and Jesus so wittingly said, Whose picture is on that coin? Well, they said, that's Caesar's. Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and God's what's God's. Meaning that we have to pay our taxes. We have to obey the laws of the land because those governments, even though, even though we may not always understand God's plan in the governments, we know from Daniel 4 and in Daniel 5, God still rules in the kingdoms of men they are God's minister, Romans 13, and they have the power to punish those who do not obey those laws. And so the Christian wants to live a life that's in harmony with the law of God. And friend, most of those laws are only designed to help us, to help other people, to keep our land and our countries and our families safe. Now, there are times when those laws do violate the law of God. For example, uh, Roe v. Wade. Laws that say abortion is legal and okay. Well, does the Christian just get in line behind that and support abortion? No, because God says that's murder. Exodus chapter 22, uh, Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 9, uh, that's something that's not right. And law of land may say one thing, but the law of the God says another. Uh, homosexual marriage, that's being legalized more and more. God says that's not right. Romans 1, verses 16 through 18. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Does a Christian then, if, if the law of the land says that's okay, a Christian just get behind it? No. When the law's butt heads. When man's law does not line up with God's law. God's law is right. God's law always takes precedent, and thus we, we must obey God more than man. Then in Romans chapter 13, we also learn that as far as our indebtedness, as far as our need to, to give something to man, what is it that we really owe? Romans 13, 8 teaches we owe others our love, don't we? Notice Romans 13, verse number 8. Look at what Paul says. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Do you remember the two greatest commandments? A lawyer came to Jesus in Mark chapter 12. And he asked the Lord, uh, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus responded by saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and Jesus gave the man a little more than he asked for. And he said, The second like unto it is, Love your neighbor as yourself. My first responsibility and yours is to love God with everything I've got. In keeping with that, I also want to love others as myself. What do I owe people in my town, my neighborhood, my community, my country, and in this world? To love them. That's the only debt that I really ought to have. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have a debt. That's not the idea. But the main debt that I owe everybody is to love one another. Why is that a debt? Because at one time I needed God's love. And I was indebted to Him. And God expressed that love so beautifully in Jesus Christ that I want to reciprocate that type of love to others as well. In fact, Paul will say that the real essence of all law, the real essence of God's law is love, is it not? Look at Romans chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. The Scripture records this. For the commandments, what about these old Ten Commandments? The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, 
you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Love was the underwriting principle behind every command. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not covet. Why all of that? Love is the reason that I don't murder. Because I love other people. Love is the foundation why I don't steal. Because I don't want somebody to do that to me and that's not loving. Love's why I don't commit adultery. Love is why I don't covet. Love is the undergirding. It's the foundation for every law that's ever been, including the law of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And part of that extends into Romans chapter 14 where Paul tells us as well, we need to love and be considerate of our brothers also. Every Christian, each Christian, should feel obligated to take someone who's maybe weaker or a babe in Christ and help them develop and mature as a Christian especially in matters of opinion, which much of chapter 14 deals with. The context of chapter 14 is this. In the town of Rome, there would be a marketplace, much like going to the supermarket. And there would be butcher shops, if we can use that word, meat resellers in that marketplace, and they would sell various cuts of meat and things like that, and you could go down and get meat. Well, the problem some of these Christians are having is they saw the meat, the cow that was offered, uh, was offered at a temple, then that temple took that cow they'd been offered, sold it to the butcher, and that meat was then slaughtered and given to the community. Well, some are going, well, wait a minute now, that cow was offered at the temple. Doesn't make that meat unclean? And Paul says, no, uh, the idol's not anything. The meat isn't anything either because the idol isn't anything. And if you're not involved in that idolatry, you eating meat is not a sin. Buying meat at the lo local butcher shop does not make it a sin because idols are not real and the meat's just meat. It came from God. But he says this though, in Romans chapter 14, this is what the whole discussion is about. If you eating that meat causes your brother to stumble, if that weaker Christian who you ought to be trying to help develop and mature doesn't understand that, or has a hang up with it, or hasn't grown to the point where he can realize there's no association between the two, don't eat meat. Paul says, I'm not going to eat meat if it makes my brother stumble. This is addressed in Romans 14. It's addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In fact, look at what he says in Romans 14, verses 14 and 15 about this idea. Paul says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food or meat, you no longer are walking in love. If what I do causes my brother to sin or affects his faith negatively, even though it may not be wrong. And friend, I want to help my brother. I want to, I want to do what I can to help him mature. Now, if someone continues to stay in a state where they're not growing and not maturing and are always getting their feelings hurt, well, then we need to talk about that matter a little more. But if it's something they haven't learned or struggling with or dealing with, if it's because steak causes somebody to sin, Paul says, I'll never eat another steak again. I'm not going to eat meat. I'm going to do what I can to help my brother in every way to grow and mature as a Christian. And so the basic idea is kind of summed up in the very last verse of Romans 14. Notice what he says about this in Romans 14, verse number 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. Here's the key word again. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Whatever is not based on the word of God and having obedient trust in God is sinful. If someone doesn't know that it's okay to eat that meat, then they're doing it in sin. They're not doing it by faith. They're doing it with doubt. And that kind of doubt is not based on the truth. And so when they study the truth and learn the truth and realize from the Word of God that's okay, then they can do it based on faith. But until that point, their faith is not what it ought to be. One of the practical applications is everything we do ought to be based on faith. I want to have faith in what I'm doing. I, think is I want to do it with a good conscience, knowing that God sanctions it through the Word of God and that God gives me the right to do that or tells me that I shouldn't do that. And friend, isn't that why God gave us the Bible? to know what's right, how we ought to live, to know about Jesus and how He lived, and to, to know what God wants us to do. And if there are matters that we're not sure of, hey, let's study on them. Let's grow in them 
before we just go out and do them. The otherwise would not be contrary or would be contrary to the will of God. Then moving into Romans 15, Paul kind of discusses the idea that that's exactly why God gave us the Bible, that we should no longer be weak spiritually, but that we can grow in the knowledge of Him. Look at Romans 15, verses 1 through 3. The Apostle Paul says, We then who are strong, spiritually speaking, we then who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses or scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Why? For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And so Paul says, bear with them. You know, we're to bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, verse 1 following teaches, And for somebody who's weaker in the faith, hey, I want to bear with them. I want to work with them. I want to help them. I don't want to just run them over or push them aside and do whatever I want. Instead, we want to help them grow and develop and mature as a Christian. And so we ought to help people who are not as spiritually strong. And, maybe, and this is not a... Uh, superiority complex or I'm better than you. That's not what we're talking about. Somebody who's stronger in the faith has got there through a lot of effort, a lot of work, and the patience of a lot of other people as well. I want to put myself in the place of someone who's not as strong and I want to help bring them up, not look down on them or you know, run them over or push them out of the way kind of mentality. And then Paul mentions how we grow in the faith. That's why God gave us the scriptures, right? The Old Testament scriptures, the Word of God in general, was given to help us learn and grow. Isn't that what the context of Romans 15 is about? Look at Romans 15, 4. Well, if I'm weak, how do I get stronger? That's why God gave us the Bible. Romans 15, verse 4 says, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. What about that weaker brother? Give him time. Give him time to study the Word of God. The things that were written aforetime, they're written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might find hope. God gave us the Bible so that we don't have to remain spiritually immature. God gave us the Scriptures so that we don't stay in a state of spiritual weakness. If I choose to ignore the Word of God, not study the Word of God, not read it, and remain in spiritual ignorance, that's not on God or other people. But if I'm trying to learn and grow, friend, direct your attention to the Bible books of men, uh, writings of men, commandments of men, that's not where you're going to grow spiritually. If you want to learn and grow spiritually and become spiritually strong, well, friend, you do that by learning the Word of God. Going all the way back and learning the Old Testament, there's, listen carefully, sometimes people say about members of the Lord's Church, you're the people who don't believe in the Old Testament. That's not true. Now we do believe that the Old Testament's been completed in Christ. Romans 7 verse 4, that He's the end or completion of the law. But friend, the Old Testament has great lessons about God, about life, about how to love your neighbor and how to love God and, and things that God wants us to do that are just general principles. I'm not going to be judged by the Old Testament as a standard. John 12, 48 tells me I'll be judged by the words of Christ. But friend, it's still the Word of God, is it not? And there are great valuable lessons to learn from that as well. And when we do put our attention to God and to His Word, when we do look to the Bible, this is how Christians with, with that unified voice can glorify and honor God in everything that they say and do. Notice Romans chapter 15. Paul will say, beginning in verse number 5, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants Christians to, with a unified voice, honor and glorify Him. In a world where there's so much division, confusion, in chaos. How are Christians going to unite and glorify God with one mind and one voice? Well, you got to back up to verse 4. The Scriptures are how we do that. And we look to the Word of God. We let it be our final authority. We let it be our final guide. And then when Christians are living by, studying, and trying to walk by the Word of God every day, then we will naturally be glorifying God with one mind and one voice because it's His mind and His voice that we're following. 
We now come to the final chapter in our study of the book of Romans and Paul will give some concluding thoughts in this chapter just to leave on the hearts and minds of the people who he's addressed this letter to. Remembering that the overall message is that the gospel is God's power to save. Well, here are some things Paul wants these Christians to remember. Be kind to one another, love one another, and always strive to live according to the teaching of the Bible. Don't be divisive, but rather put your trust and hope in God. You know, we learn about the church that these people were a part of, don't we? Uh, what, what was the church that the people in the book of Romans were a part of? Well, notice Romans 16, verse 16. Greet or salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Friend, in the Bible, what you do find is this. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, just a few verses over. It's the church of God, which is at Corinth. Uh, Romans 16, verse 16, it's the church of Christ, churches of Christ in Rome. Acts 20, verse 28, it is the church of the Lord. 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3 verses 14 and 15, it's the church of the living God. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Matthew 16, verse 18, whose church were these people a part of? Well, the only church that existed. The one body, the one church, God's church the Lord's church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of those designations give honor to God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, the one who made the ultimate sacrifice, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for the church. Friend, if we're going to follow the power of the gospel to save, we want to keep the emphasis upon God and upon His church and the church that we read about in the Bible, not the multiplicity of denominations today that are following the teachings of men. In fact, it's that ideology. The ideology that everybody can have their own way and I'm going to follow this man and you follow this man and their teaching and we're all going to somehow end up at the same place. Friend, that's where the division comes from, does it not? Isn't that what Romans 16 verse 17 is teaching us? Notice the very next verse. Romans 16, 17, Paul says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. What should my responsibility and relationship be toward those who are teaching things that are different than what God has taught us in the Bible? Somebody says, you know, you can be saved by following X religion. And it's not found in the Bible, whatever it may be. Friend, I'm not going to associate with that religion. I'm not going to promote that. I'm not going to teach that's okay. That's divisive, and that causes the body of Christ to not follow the pattern that God wants it to follow. And Paul will note that many of these people, many of these divisive teachers who are teaching things contrary to what you find in the Bible, really have an ulterior motive. And that motive is to serve their own lust not the will of God. In fact, Paul says that in the very next verse. Look at verse number 18. Paul says of these divisive teachers, for those who are such, those who teach doctrines that are not right, those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Friend, don't be tricked by those who are, are, are saying things that are smooth and popular. You can live like you want. You can do what you want. God's going to love you anyway. Just go out and do whatever in the name of Jesus. My well, friend, you know, there's a lot of people who probably like to do that. There's a lot of people who do do that. But what do we really need to follow? Not people who just have smooth words and tell everybody what they want to hear. But we want to follow the Bible. My friend, the Bible has a good, smooth perfect way of living, but it's got to be God's way, not people who are out to fill their own pockets, not people who are out to fill their own desire, but rather we want to put our trust and our hope in Almighty God and we want to make sure that we're letting Him guide us in everything that we say and do. And friend, the key to that is obedient faith. Obedience has always been key to pleasing God. Look again at the close of the book of Romans, Romans 16, 19. I want you to know what God says. God says, for your obedience has become known to all men. Now jump down to verse 26. 
and now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures, made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. Friend, God's not unkind or unjust or unloving, but God does expect men and women to obey Him. And not only does God expect that, but if you obey God, you're going to have the best life you can imagine. Why did Jesus come? To force people to obey Him? No. Jesus came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus gave us the gospel, which has the power to save all men. And friend, if I will lovingly obey the Lord Jesus Christ, have an obedient type of faith, that does whatever God says, tries to live according to His will. When I sin, I repent and make that right, trying to walk in the light. Friend, that's going to give you the best, happiest, most joyous and fulfilling life you could ever imagine. And so we ask you today, in view of the wonderful message of the book of Romans, that the gospel is God's power to save and that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Friend, if you're not in Christ, don't you desperately, won't you please obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? God does not want you to be lost. We do not want men and women to, to suffer the consequences of spiritual death for all eternity. Nobody wants that. Why not become a Christian? Do you really believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Nobody can come to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6. Would you be willing to repent of sin, repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out, Acts 3, verse 19. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And would you do what the book of Romans teaches to contact the death of Jesus? For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death you've never become a Christian, we urge you to do that today. If you are a Christian, then friend, the encouragement is, the encouragement is keep living for Christ. Keep living as a sacrifice. Don't give up. Look toward that reward. And may God help each of us to live in such a way that we give God the glory. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.